of this uh, of this meeting. Uh, in this first session, it's uh, appropriately called session one. <laughs> and, um, I mean, maybe uh, I mean add a little bit to what Brett was uh, to, to what Brett was saying. Uh, I mean, before this meeting, I, I heard back from a few people uh, who said, I, I seem to be in the wrong session. Uh, and basically, because they were looking at the other speakers in the session and said, these are people that I have absolutely nothing to do with. Um, uh, however, this is really on purpose. Uh, I mean, all of you uh, have, here been, have been invited here with, a, with secretly a, a label attached to your name. <laughs> Maybe you were an autosecond person in our view, or a Ritberg person, or a quantum control person, or a theory person. Uh, but in the program, we've uh, on purpose uh, completely mixed this up, uh, and that's really odd because you know in, in this workshop here the next few days we kind of want to lose uh, those labels, forget about those labels for a bit, uh, and really get the discussions between these fields uh, started or continue the discussion. Of course, it's something that, that's already somewhat uh, somewhat going on. Um, and so that's uh, that I just really wanted to uh, wanted to mention and. Now, I would say then, without further delay, let's, uh, let's go to the first speaker, uh, local speaker, since, uh, since a short time, uh, Artem Rudenko, who will tell us about uh, uh, interatomic relaxation processes after the shell Thank you, Mark. So, good morning, everybody. Let me start with thanking uh, Brad, Mark, and Willard for the opportunity to speak here. For me, as you can understand, it's a particular pleasure since I just started here. I will discuss with you today uh, atomic uh, dynamics and electronic dynamics after inertial photonization of molecules. And I will spend the next half an hour trying to convince you that this is a uh, very exciting, important, and appropriate topic for ultra-fast science and in particular <coughs> And uh, just to start, uh, those of you who have really seen the beginning of the other second science uh, for sure remember that one of the first demonstrations of uh, other second spectroscopy was actually done with an inertial process. So as soon as they got a uh, sub femtosecond pulse, uh, uh, about a decade ago, one of uh, the uh, proof of principal experiments was measuring a lifetime for, uh, with respect to a decay for a Clifton M shell vacancy. And uh, of course, this is just a proof of principal experiment since you can get the same information uh, from the energy domain measurement. But however, this is a very fast process and this seems to be very appropriate uh, to this first proof of principal experiment. Since then, uh, there was, of course, a lot of discussion where, uh, in this field, you really need that shot pulses. And uh, one simple immediate uh, extension is, if you go to molecules which fragment upon a JDK, and uh, where a JDK happens uh, on the moving nuclear, then you cannot get the same information from an element, so you really need time resolving. Even more often, it was suggested that uh, we need ultra-short pulses uh, to study uh, very uh, fancy phenomenon known as interatomic Coulombic decay. So this is, I, I always consider this as an extreme case of an energy process in an uh, exotic quasi-molecular system where Ajé, just on a single atom, is not allowed simply energetically. However, if there is a second atom in the vicinity uh, of the absorbing one, uh, one can transfer a virtual quantum of energy from one uh, atom to another and uh, emit a low energy electron from the neighbor. And uh, since uh, this again ha uh, happens in a system which dissociates upon this process and Coulomb explode, then uh, it's very natural that uh, the question was always how fast is this? I hope we were able to answer this question by direct time and measurements uh, very recently. It took about 10 years by now, so we've done first time result measurements of these processes. It's not really, or by today's scale, it's not really an ultra fast measurement. So we define a lifetime of about 150 and femtosecond uh, with about uh, 50 femtosecond resolution. So it might not sound that great. But I do believe that this really uh, sets an important milestone, and then from here on we can go uh, to a number of uh, similar phenomena which occur much faster and 
just to bribe you a little bit, so this was done in a prototype system of a neon dimer, and if you go to trimer or some of larger neon cluster, already the same process becomes much faster, approaching uh, one femtosecond second limit for uh, a cluster of about 50 atoms. But today I would like to speak about something uh, which is somewhere in between this two phenomena. I would like to talk about uh, Agent decay in dissociating molecules and charge transfer in dissociating molecules. So, uh, in particular, the focus of uh, almost on interatomic phenomena because here uh, we can really uh, make use of our unique novel shot pulses. And uh, uh, we'll start with an inner shell ionization, and this gives us a uh, very well localized starting point. And the main focus of uh, the experiments I will be talking about is uh, how the charge is redistributed really upon this initial inner shell ionization, what are the role of interatomic processes, if there are any, and uh, more specifically, can we say something about molecular Ajay processes, which were discussed for a long time in Sintertron? Can we define this as local, non local processes, and so on? So, uh, the idea of this experiment looks uh, pretty simple. We also uh, here have to mention that uh, we do not only do this with X rays, we also do it with rather intense X rays. The reason for this is that uh, one of the most common sources for short pulses are free electron lasers, and uh, free electron laser applications are also normally based on uh, extremely intense pulses. And these uh, kind of cross links these two fields. So what we do, we implement in a molecule one heavy atom, has the atom which uh, has a very large absorption cross-section, much larger than the rest of the system, and thus we localize our initial steps. Then uh, we look for what happened after this, there are few motivational points for this, and again, from the point of view of free electron laser applications, one of the uh, most important ones is that uh, this phenomenon directly describes how radiation damage occurs to molecular system. And this is a crucial point for uh, almost all X-ray imaging procedures, and thus this is really a, a crucial issue for the whole FAF physics. To be more particular on this, there was uh, one particular proposal to use high impurities for phasing uh, heat diffraction imaging patterns, so, so-called multi-wavelength anomalous diffraction. It was proposed by the group of Robin Santra, and uh, it is based on a uh, very efficient ionization of heavy atoms inside a uh, molecular environment. But in order to do this, uh, and in order to uh, estimate how feasible this approach is, it will be really good to understand what happens in the vicinity of such a heavy atom when it absorbs uh, photon or photons. And as I mentioned, the very crucial point is our initial excitation is very well localized. And our initial positive charge is also very well localized. And depending on uh, how deep is the shell, which we are analyzing, not only the initial photoabsorption and the first photoelectron uh, and such corresponding holes is localized, but also the intermediate transition much be more, might be more likely to happen in the vicinity. So we can have uh, also large positive charge very well localized. But of course, all this activity starts with atoms. And uh, by now, we have a decent idea of what happens with atoms uh, uh, under strong X-ray pulse. And already the first experiments at SLAC in X-ray demand showed that light elements like neon or nitrogen could be completely stripped here. And all this ionization can be very reasonably described as a sequence of uh, one photon absorption steps simply sequential single photon process. And there were several experiments really aiming to find signatures of direct two photon absorption, so sort of non-sequential process. And uh, they were to some extent successful, but uh, it was obvious that these contributions are extremely weak. So talking about the dominant mechanism for most of the practical cases, we can uh, simply forget. But since we are interested in heavy atoms there, things might get a little bit more complicated. So again, the very first experiment shows that heavy elements would be extremely highly charged. And we can imagine this, uh, if we talk about the X-rays, already single photon can produce a highly charged ion. And in kilowatts, as you can see here, we can produce up to xenon 8 plus, for example. 
Now, if you combine energy with many photons, of course, you can get much higher charge states. And most of you probably have seen this paper uh, from Flash a few years ago, where they combine up to 50 photons, but it's 100 dB to get 16 and 21 plus. Very recently, we got uh, uh, all the 3D shell electron incidence strip, uh, irradiating it with uh, intense 1.5 kilowatt pulses at SLEC. And uh, one particular uh, feature in this experience was that it turned out that we are way beyond this uh, naive sequential model. And we uh, can explain whatever we see in these charged states, <coughs> we extend this uh, to include bound bound transitions. So, uh, even for these extreme charged states, at least at kilovolt photon energies, the sequential model is reasonably good if you include all atomic states which are available. So, but that also means that intermediate atomic resonances which you are uh, creating multiple charged ions are also important. And we've seen signatures of this in different systems in uh, xenon, krypton, and so on. So, but uh, <coughs> apart from this resonance, this is still a process which can be considered as a uh, sequence of uh, single photo absorption set with certain delay uh, in between each step. And now, uh, coming from atoms to molecules, uh, one can easily think that uh, as soon as you get at least one neighbor to that, you have a number of possibilities uh, to change this multipolarization process. So, uh, of course, you have other electrons on the neighboring atoms, so they first change the potential, they also can directly uh, participate in all these relaxation processes, the Ajeka states, and so on. And, of course, uh, since you have two centers, at least, you can start to think about inter- and interatomic channels. So, in a simple, uh, moderately small diatomic molecule, this would be an academic concept because uh, you cannot really tell from which uh, atom the participating electrons are coming. However, we know that this multipolarization also triggers molecularization, so the nucleus starts to move. And as soon as they start to move fire, enough apart, then this concept of intra and interatomic uh, channels of local and non-local proteins immediately starts to make sense. And this is what we'll try to exploit in our today's discussion. And of course, uh, we can start with a simple homonuclear diatomic molecule, but if you go to uh, heteronuclear systems, then again, tuning the uh, wavelengths, you can uh, localize your initial absorption step simply ionizing one of the atoms. And to get an idea uh, what happened there, just uh, make a very rough sketch of a potential well. So we start uh, with photoabsorption, again localizing high the atom, and for simplicity we assume that the neighbor doesn't absorb at all. Then we start with, a, with one hole, and uh, one sort of photon triggers a relaxation uh, process, or maybe a cascade of this. And uh, the first steps, again, if we have some intermediate shells, the first steps typically occurs on the same atom, however, as soon as valence electrons are involved uh, in this relaxation process, we cannot really tell anymore. Now, to make things more complicated, if you would have an XFA pulse, uh, which contains about 10 to 12 photons, then, of course, we can have multiple photoabsorptions, and each of these photons would also trigger a cascade. So, uh, and then uh, we would have, on top of our a jet time scale and nuclear motion time scale will have also <coughs> the time scale given simply by the delay between the subsequent photoabsorption steps. And uh, you can estimate that all three processes essentially proceed on the same few femtosecond time scale. <coughs> it means that we have uh, three interview processes and uh, kind of a real mess. Uh, however, we need to try, at least to try to understand this mess in order really to handle XFA replication in any kind of realistic system. Now, what helps us a lot is that if we are thinking about interatomic processes, they depend a lot on the internuclear distance. And then you can try to develop a concept of an experiment where you exploit this, where you artificially increase internuclear distance, either increasing the size of the molecule or dissociating with this with the rays. So, and uh, here's how we proceed. So we started with some very simple molecules, went to 
somewhat more complicated polyatomic systems. And the key point is that we always used heavy atoms, which we can compare to the isolated rare gas atoms, where we know what happens, or at least roughly know what happens, and we know the numbers of the charge states we achieve. So we used selenium, which has very similar absorption properties to krypton, and iodine, which is very close to xenon. <coughs> and with this, we can really cover a uh, significant amount of uh, chemically relevant molecular systems. And uh, the ex uh, first experiment which I will discuss here was done at uh, SRS. And you all have probably by now heard that SRS was the first uh, operating X-ray free electron laser. And uh, it's a huge machine which uses the one kilometer of the old VNAC and then brings the X-ray into a couple of experimental holes down here. And for the purpose of our discussion, it is important to uh, realize that uh, by now we have got the, a very broad photon energy range from a few hundred EV to 10 kilo electron volts in photon energies. We get huge photon numbers, uh, 10 to 12, 10 to 13 photons per pulse, which corresponds to a few millijoules. So we get the same pulse energy as uh, typical kilohertz laser system in the lab. And uh, also crucial, we can get variable pulse duration, and the shortest limit would be as short as few femtoseconds. Of course, if we really go down to five femtoseconds <coughs> below, we lose some of these photons, so we pin down this number. And uh, we combine this unique X-ray facility with our technology of ion momentum imaging. So I will try to be brief here. So what we do, we cross the molecular beam with the SLS beam in the middle of uh, electrostatic imaging spectrometer, and we project ions. I will be talking at the beginning only about ions in this experiment. We project them onto time and position sensitive detector, and we get three-dimensional momentum vectors of few of them, and uh, what few means is simply limited by the SRS repetition rate, which is 120 hertz at the moment. So we can do very decent uh, double K incidences. We have uh, some reasonable data for triple K incidences. We cannot measure more than three particles at the moment. And uh, with this, we can get channel selective yields, kinetic energy of the fragments, emission angles, and so on. So with this kind of technology, we get really a lot of information of uh, the fragmentation process. And one thing to take home is that for the type of experiment which I discussed today, coincidences are crucially important because we really want to define the uh, ultimate final ch uh, charge state of the system. So we need to know ideally all the fragments. <coughs> and, uh, I start with the, I'll start with the comparison of uh, ionization of krypton by rather short 2 kilovolt LCS pulse with the ionization of methyl selenium molecule. And again, selenium has the same absorption cross section, but however, if in krypton we come to a single atom charge of 16 plus, in selenium the high charge states we absorbed uh, was about 8 or 9 plus, so almost half of the value. And since absorption is the same, we need to trace where the rest of the charge go because it would be surprising if it would completely disappear. And with our coincident traces, we immediately see that, okay, the selenium doesn't come alone. It also has a car charge carbon partner. And if you look in detail to this, the child charge set combination for this uh, <coughs> molecule is selenium 9 plus and carbon 3 plus. So we get 12 charges. Now, protein methyl selenol molecule, we have 12 charges, and uh, of course we can immediately see that it's extremely unlikely uh, to get a neutral hydrogen atom in the vicinity of a ninefold charge selenium. So if we assume that <coughs> all of the uh, hydrogens are charged, then we'll get in total 16 charges here, which bring us back roughly to our xenon charge state, which we have. So, so that means that uh, almost half of the charge is pretty efficiently spread uh, over the molecular system, which fragments. And uh, this happens uh, on the time scale of our multipolarization. It, partly, it is partly defined by the duration of the pulse, which is extremely short. In this case, probably the ultimate time limit would be set by somewhat longer RJ time. Because many realization channels would take more time than 500 a second to reach the final charge. And then uh, we can quantitatively plot charge state distribution, and here, the crypto is shown in red, and in black, uh, 
as the distribution for a methyl selenol molecule is shown, assuming that all the products are charged. And you see that we get a very decent uh, uh, agreement there. And in order to uh, get rid of this assumption of proton uh, being created, we can repeat the same experiment for diatomic molecule. And they can, we compare ionization of ICA with xenon. And uh, again, we can in this case, we can define uh, the final state ion pairs, which really gives us the exact final charge state. And uh, if we compare the distribution with xenon, we see that in general it's pretty similar. So we come to the same highest charge state of 34, 35. We have some deviations which might have something to do with the exact structure of the resonances which I mentioned, but we don't really know what this. But for the purpose of our, our uh, current discussion, it is important that we essentially get the same amount of charge on a uh, uh, small molecule, which is very fast distribu redistributed over the whole molecular system. Now, uh, I would ask ourselves how, uh, how this is happening. And the first step in, uh, in order to, uh, to understand this would be to look for somewhat more differential observables. So here we looked at just the charge states. Of course, we measure a lot of observables. So we can uh, get angles, energies, and then we start with protein uh, kinetic energy again for the same reaction for the fragmentation of this methyl selenol molecule. And since uh, the energies would be finally defined to a large extent by Coulomb repulsion, uh, it's clear that we need to plot energies for a particular channel. And you can imagine that we have plenty of possible channels. There is no way you can list all of them here. So I will take three exemplary channels with increasing total charge states and plot for the beginning selenium and carbon fragment energies. And as one might expect, the uh, energies are shifted towards higher values to higher charges, so simply reflecting the uh, Coulomb law. And now, in order to get some initial information about the uh, timing of this multipolarization, we compare the results which we measure experimentally with the outcome of our very simple Coulomb explosion model, where we assume that uh, whatever final state we got was reached instantaneously and all electrons were removed at an equilibrium distance. And then we have one value for the center of the center of gravity of the wave packet for each final charge state combination. This is shown here as vertical lines. Now, if you look for the lowest charge states for the uh, selenium 1C, uh, then we see that uh, actually our simulation matches it pretty well. And we can understand why. Because here we have a photoabsorption, an extremely fast uh, localized AG decay, which is faster than one frame per second. So it doesn't take time, the molecule doesn't have to, uh, time to propagate, so we get very close to equilibrium uh, of explosion geometry. Now if we go to for a higher charge state, we start obviously to overestimate uh, our energy with the Coulomb explosion model. And this simply shows that uh, this simply shows that the molecule uh, moves on the time scale of multipolarization. And uh, if we go for higher charge state, then we see that we really start to overestimate it considerably. And this is uh, exactly show us how the molecule moves within the pulse. Again, uh, keeping in mind that, uh, uh, that most of the time uh, might be needed to for these later relaxation steps, and, and not only for the proper absorption. Now, in order to follow up on this, if we plot the proton energies, then even for the lowest charge states, and we overestimate uh, this, and this is also very easy to understand. The protons are extremely fast, and even this first one frame per second, we need to reach these lowest charge states, uh, already means something. They move few distances <coughs> per frame per second with those energies. So, uh, essentially, this data directly show us uh, the measure of radiation damage to the molecule, how much the nuclear moved. And if you would extend this for really large systems which are of interest for imaging, then this would be really a major breakthrough. Now, of course, uh, you can do much more with this kind of uh, technology. You can look, as I mentioned, for angles. You can also look for intensity dependence on each particular channel and see how many photons is needed to reach this final state, and so on. But uh, uh, also, uh, found a couple of interesting things analyzing these uh, distributions in more details. For example, we got some signature that 
uh, for certain channels, we create a transient complex of highly charged selenium and carbon, which decays, uh, just given its charge to the protons, and it's described in this uh, paper published beginning of this year. But for now, I would like to, uh, so you, you can see that this is really a very complicated process. So uh, try to show you an example where we can disentangle at least some steps here and we can control to some extent an intermediate distance of a similar type of molecule. So, and we do this uh, with the laser pump X-ray probe experiment. So the idea of this is uh, rather simple. We come uh, with 800 nanometer laser pulse, we ionize and dissociate methyl iodide molecule, and then we study X-realization fermentation as a function of the delay between uh, the laser and X-ray pulse. And in this case, we choose this uh, 1500 EV pulse, which gave us extremely high level ionization of semen. And then we can trace all of our observables as a function of time and thus as a function of the internuclear distance. And we've chosen this system because after the uh, laser impact, it tactically behaves as a uh, two-body system. So it essentially this says in iodine as a neutral charge and CH3 also as a neutral charge. And then of course when it absorbs in this one X-ray photon, it's highly ionized and decays. And uh, now there is uh, the first outcome of this uh, experiment. This is simply a time of light spectra where you can see uh, a lot of different fragments. You can see some sharp structure originating from uh, laser ionization of the bound molecules. And you can see pretty high charge states, in this case, up to iodine 25 plus. And of course, for each of these peaks, again, we have our momentum maps. And uh, you can see that depending on whether it's produced by X-rays and by the laser, it has different shapes. It's either isotropic or aligned along the laser polarization, which is parallel to our time of light direction. Uh, also, please know this uh, large number of very sharp dots corresponding to higher charge states. So you see that uh, they're very well localized, and that means that those fragments have very low energy. So this would be important for our further discussions. But in order to understand this now, we take this spectrum, or at least part of this spectrum, and plot it as a function of our delay between uh, infrared and uh, X-ray pulse. And here, I just plotted it for two particular charge states of iodine. And you clearly see uh, several different lines here. And you also clearly see that some of them, the inner part of them, are delay dependent. And uh, in general, uh, all of you have seen uh, plots of kinetic energy is the function of the delay for pump probe experiments. Uh, immediately recognize these curves, which simply reflect the molecular dissociation where uh, the molecule is fragmented, dissociates, and the later the probe pulse comes, the larger is the uh, internuclear distance for a Coulomb explosion, and thus the smaller is the Coulomb explosion energy. And these curves, uh, which are clearly bent here, simply reflect this energy. Uh, decrease in energy for a dissociating molecule. Now to drive it to the extreme, I can plot uh, two cuts, so the region of higher charge states, one made uh, very late here, the red one where uh, the X-ray comes much, much, few picoseconds later, much, much later than the laser pulse. And you see the sharp peaks indicating that a lot of uh, molecules are dissociated. And you also can see that for high charge states, it's difficult to resolve some inner structure, but we do have some structure which we clearly resolve for lower charge states. And uh, so these are time of flight data. In order to think about uh, the length scale, it's better to recalculate it into the kinetic energy. And here, uh, the kinetic energy uh, uh, measured as a function of the delay between the, my, my pump and probe pulses is plotted for <coughs> one particular fragment, iron 6, plus as a function of this delay. And uh, again, so you see in general three structures, and uh, these three structures correspond to backward and forward ions in this time of light spectrum. So each line in the energy spectrum is simply doubled here. And we have a uh, rather broad and uh, almost delay independent band at high energy, which simply reflects the molecule which uh, either didn't see the laser at all or were not fragmented, which are fragmented at <coughs> a small internuclear distance and get high energy. And we also clearly see this dissociating band going down here. Uh, 
uh, which correspond to the molecular dissociation which, uh, after the laser pulse, which I already discussed. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what is also pretty noticeable, especially if you make a projection at high energies, is that there is a very sharp peak of fragments with almost zero energy. And uh, if you look here, in the beginning, uh, there's actually nothing on this channel at very small delays. And if I put the rate of this channel now as a function of the delay, simply the projection of its lowest line is the delay <coughs> axis, you clearly see that it really starts from zero. So there are no of these fragments uh, at small delays, and uh, it gets flat at about 200 frames per second. Uh, now, uh, this channel turned out to uh, reflect one of the processes where, essentially after, one of the hints which we, uh, so uh, first we have very low energies, another important hint which we got here is that this low energy band uh, almost disappeared, was strongly suppressed if we plot this in coincidence with any charged state of carbon which we measure. And uh, from these two conclusions, uh, from these two observations, we can conclude that essentially these are the events uh, which uh, originate from a pair of iodine being highly charged and CH3 plus remaining neutral. Because any other energy would simply, uh, any other charged states of carbon would simply give us considerably higher Coulomb explosion energy. And now, what happens here, is, uh, what we believe happens here is that. Uh, in the first pulse after the laser, we don't have the configuration sketched here, but we have a charge sitting on the iodine atom and the neutral CH3 fragment. <laughs> and the branching ratio for laser dissociation of this molecule is pretty symmetric, so it's uh, almost as probable to get the charge here or here. Now, if we have small internuclear distance and absorb one photon, and remember, the photon is always absorbed as the iodine atom. So, if we absorb this photon at small internuclear distance, we get our high charge state, but part of the charge is obviously shared with the uh, uh, molecular partner, and thus we get at least one charged fragment, we get Coulomb explosion, and we end up somewhere at higher energies. However, as soon as uh, our charge transfer from absorbing iodine atom to non absorbing CH3 becomes uh, less probable, then there is certain probability that these fragments remain neutral. And uh, if it remains neutral, we get our uh, uh, low energy fragment. So that means that essentially this curves uh, directly maps the length scale of the charge transfer between the absorbing iodine and non-absorbing uh, CHC fragment. Now, uh, in order to follow up on this, we know that carbon doesn't absorb. So let's see what higher charge states of carbon are doing here. And if I plot the uh, rate for the higher charge states of carbon, it goes down. And it goes down uh, almost on the same scale, on the same 200 femtosecond. So uh, we were extremely glad to see this, and uh, this really confirmed our idea on how this happened, and it was consistent. However, if you look in more detail than this plot, there is something which is kind of strange. So this rate goes down, becomes flat, has kind of plateau maybe in a local maximum, then go down, goes down again. So, and uh, if we recalculate to which internal register this plateau would uh, correspond, and from the energies we know the velocity of our wave packets, this would correspond to huge internal distance, to something like 30, 40, or 50 Armstrongs. And there is nothing really which, will, which we know to be efficient in this, uh, at these huge distances. Uh, even in terms of a Coulombic decay, would be kind of uh, dropping down, drops down to the power of one over R over six. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand this until we got a very simple answer for this. Uh, at some point, we started looking at angular distributions, and when we looked at the angular distributions of these carbon fragments, we saw that essentially it changes within the same range as our plateau. And this is a trivial thing, this impulsive molecular alignment induced by our 800 nanometer pulse. And this, 800, uh, this clearly correlates with our plateau. This didn't give us a direct answer because we were not aware of any physical process which would be so extremely alignment sensitive. However, what we realized somewhat later is that our fragments which we are looking at are about 200 electron volts fast. So they're very energetic. And it's simply, uh, in this case, uh, the explanation for our plateau is simply that the alignment pulse modulates 
the acceptance of our detector. It simply turns the molecule along our time of flight axis. And uh, since we don't have a four pi acceptance here, it produces an additional structure. And this is a very easy concept to check because we have all the data and we can make a cut on our energy. And now if I plot the same curve for uh, low energy fragments, low energy means again here up to 75 MB, but those which we have four pi acceptance, then this plateau almost disappears. So essentially that means that this is kind of a fancy artifact of molecular alignment. And in general we get the same scale for our uh, charge transfer between iodine and carbon as we have done, uh, as we have seen for this low energy effect. Uh, now, if I recalculate the distance corresponding to the rise time of this curve, we get out something like a 5 n stem. And 5 uh, n stem can atomic unit will give you a distance where you think your valence electrons will become localized. Uh, <coughs> Now, uh, the next step would be, of course, to try to get the functionality of this R dependence to see how, it, how exactly it depends on R. We can fit our data. But what is seemingly clear is that this really correlates with simply these two potential wells being overlapped or not. And then we have two obvious uh, possibilities for a charge transfer. This is either the uh, so to say, interatomic molecular GDK where it just involves the delocalized valence electron, or we might think of a direct uh, valence charge transfer. Now, I'm probably running out of time here, so uh, we've done experiment at FLASH, which also points uh, to very similar kind of processes. I will be very brief here. So here we did an experiment with 90 EV prop pulse and 90 EV pump pulse, because at FLASH you didn't get time resolution. <coughs> So we use our split mirror, and we essentially produce the same kinetic energy versus delay plots. And since our pulses are now symmetric, this plot is also getting symmetric. And it also reflects all different possible uh, dissative curves with the difference that here we can also induce multi-photon and multi-polarization also within our pump pulse. But the important point is that if we look for asymmetric final state coincident channels, then we see that at zero delays, we essentially get a very low rate of those, and if you go for higher symmetries, we lose them completely. So, for, for example, for island 1, island 4 coincidence channel, we lose completely the uh, events at low uh, delays. And it simply means that we do not get these channels at low intermediate distance again. That means that uh, we cannot get any significant charge asymmetry because of the charge exchange. And this gives us a very similar picture, as I just described for CH4, and if you look for kinetic energy release, we essentially get the same length scale for this part. So with this, I'm essentially at the end of my talk. To summarize, we have shown that uh, upon inertial ionization, we have a uh, different kind of uh, very efficient charge distribution processes. And uh, we obviously see that they are suppressed with their own internuclear distance. We need to clarify whether the role of the alignment is restricted to our technical artifacts or it enters somehow on a lower level. Also, the rates which we absorb, and we absorb for different systems, we absorb a clear transition of about uh, five angstroms. And uh, I would directly make a statement that this is very likely signature of simply uh, delocalization of valence electrons, and then we can make uh, a guess what which one of the two uh, pictures is better suited, and I think Thomas Thomas Pfeiffer will briefly address it for the iodine experiment. Now, just a very few words about few next steps. So first, obviously, we might need the electron spectrum. Then we can directly distinguish these possibilities. We've got some first preliminary results from SLF, but we didn't answer this question yet. We got a jet spectrum from this dissociated methyl iodide molecule, but uh, we didn't get clear enough answer and clear enough delay dependence to verify this. So we obviously need to elaborate on this. And this is, uh, at least for this 90 uh, range, is something which can be readily done in the lab uh, with 90 V harmonics and 40 shell iodide. Now, uh, the uh, other direction of the development will be going to the larger systems. And we've done experiments on something like this, on ethyl molecule, 
Uh, and uh, they were, of course, uh, yeah, they recently proceeded with the experiments on a system like Ayoda Orasi, so a uh, real polyatomic molecule with some biological elements. And finally, we can, we can try to link this uh, charge chain, exchange and charge transfer process for very large systems like cinnamon clusters or uh, cinnamon embedded in helium zero. And uh, finally, the very last step is that. Uh, we essentially talked about femtoseconds experiments up to now. However, these questions uh, are obviously uh, reaching for other second scale because uh, in the experiments I showed you, we never directly resolve the jet time scale. And uh, this is a range of at most few femtoseconds for the system I was talking about. So you can think of the experiment where we start with a similar dissociation. And inertial ionization, however, if we use really an isolated other second pulse to this ionization, we can stick the photoelectrons and thus get uh, our agile lifetimes as a function of chemical environment. And I think this is really one of the important potential applications uh, for this for, for uh, the whole other second technology. So and with this, I would like to thank all the collaborators, the big group working at SRS and even my mass plan and uh, another big collaboration working with us at Flash, and I thank you for your attention.